Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Phil, comma, Proctor, no, Proctor, comma, Phil. Yes. I forget. But yeah. anyway. Well, we have two very interesting guests today who are, in fact, uh, two as as one. Um, another married couple we're very happy to have. Crea- uh, two very creative people who are still together after our 30 years, 31, 32 years, something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, well, 30, we're going to ask you the secret to your success uh, in a long-term relationship as part of our wide-ranging discussion today. It is Melissa Rosenberg and Lev Spiro. Melissa is a writer, screenwriter, showrunner, and Lev is a director, radio host, yes, and, uh, and fine arts photographer. Melissa. You are doing some very interesting work right now as a as a screenwriter. You're working on uh, Hillary Clinton's co-authored novel. Yes, State of Terror. State of Terror, which I happen to be reading. It's a very fun read. It's a terrific read. Um, yeah, uh, the secretary and Louise Penny uh, co-authored a suspense thriller. And uh, it was just such a fun read. And, of course, when my agent called uh, asking whether or not I was interested in adapting, uh, he told me who wrote it. And I said, you had me at Hillary. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. As long as I get to meet her, is that, that's the uh, – that I was in. That was your stipulation, right? Stipulation. Uh, yeah, she's a nice person. Very. And incredibly smart. Very, oh, yeah. very intimidating. <laughs> that's very clear. She's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Absolutely brilliant. And it's a great book. Uh, I'm only 100 pages in, but I'm enjoying it and because she's obviously – I know you can't really get into what you're doing, so we won't ask. But if you look at the book, she's having a good time writing a post-Trump presidency take. Oh, yeah. She, oh. Takes, she takes her pot shots, and it's just – Hilarious. She, her, this alter ego, I suppose, is the Secretary of State, a woman named Ellen, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they're dealing with the terrorism, but they're also dealing with the debris field left by this previous administration that was full of loyalists and hacks and demoted America's stature to a point where there's some bad stuff going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. she, made, she made all that up. Doc- it's fictional. Well, it <laughs> it's, it's a docudrama. <laughs> it's fictionalized. In, in the book, the previous president was not orange. So you don't know who she's talking about uh, necessarily. That's right. Uh, that's sure. right. Yeah, no, they're, they're doing a little hands off on that. But you also, you are perhaps known for creating and show running the, the TV series Marvel's Jessica Jones. I am. Wow. And you got a Peabody for that as I well. I did. I did. What was, why did Peabody award you for that? What do you think? <laughs> <you're supposed> to- <laughs> well, as it turned out, it, it ended up being. Uh, uh, sort of a, uh, a look, a feminist uh, perspective on uh, uh, domestic violence and ah. uh, sexual assault. And I, that was not my intention going in. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's but another Trump story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. And, and no I just recently necessary. said, boy, there's just nothing funny about sexual assault. Well, you just, there you go. <laughs> Leave it to Phil. There you go. It's called Slap Stick. <laughs> slap Stick, actually. <laughs> Tell us about the show. It was on Netflix. It was uh, Netflix had a whole series of uh, Marvel's uh, television series. Yeah, right. And uh, mm-hmm. this was one of four of these characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was just a the highlight of my career to be able oh, to write wonderful. that that show and and to and and to have it come out and and actually be something yeah. that people talked about in terms of uh those issues i that was uh, again exciting. you never you never go in thinking you're going to step on a soapbox and and do this stuff but as it turned out it it, it so co- coincided very uh, neatly with the whole Me, me Too movement. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So working for Netflix, I mean, that was a whole new paradigm. That's time. Uh, in, in Hollywood. Uh, this was what years? Uh, about five years ago, honestly. Five, five years ago. Okay, Something so. Something like that. Maybe, maybe eight. I don't this know. is where the supremacy of the streamers had come into full swing, and it was peak TV. Yes. Right, which we're now post-peak TV. Did the uh, your experience... Given this, the traditional studio system that morphed into the streamer studio system, was there? A, did you notice differences? Yeah, it was a different oh, feeling. And how I, up top? I actually had moved away from network television and into uh, this cable or premium TV when I first went on to Dexter. That was my first experience. Dexter and is such an amazing. <laughs> Michael C. Hall. Oh, the brilliant yeah. Michael C. Hall. And uh, so that was my first 
taste of, oh, this is this is different yeah. than uh, network. I mean, a story is a story is a story. So you're you're still telling um, a you tale. Know, a tale. That's right. mm-hmm. But you're telling it with uh, more time to think about it, more time to create it. You're you're with uh, fewer boundaries on on the edges, right. mm-hmm. and um, it's just a, a great. Oh yeah, so you're not dealing with broadcast standards. Mm-hmm. You're not dealing with spot breaks and having to build framework to accommodate commercials. Yeah, well, ha- when you're when you're doing network TV, you have you have to account not only for the breaks for ads, yeah. but when you come back from the ads, you have to again remind the audience what they just saw two minutes ago. Mm-hmm. So right. you spend half of your storytelling reminding people what they just saw before. That's <laughs> why maybe Netflix and the streamers always felt like every episode of the, of the big series were almost like features. Yes, very much. So, yeah, because I, they I, did sure. Hey, it's really ba- it's basically taking over the independent film arena. Most, you know, the independent films are now a lot of the features that you see uh, streaming because it, it reaches a wider well, audience. Yeah, and, I mean, how do you? I mean, Lev, you did. Um, I'm agreeing with that. I'm sitting here nodding sagely. That doesn't really <laughs> yeah. play on radio. But you've only it? done like 160 TV episodes and yeah. pilots. So yeah. the biggest change for me was not having to serve the act breaks because every act break you've got to come out on some point of tension, right. so the mm-hmm. audience wants to come back. Right. So and you know and hopefully it was in the script. Sometimes it's not in the script, so you're trying to build yeah, it, it with camera work and music and yeah. Right. So that was a great relief to just be able to make a one hour film instead of a you know yeah. 17 acts whatever. So so it was like you did an episode of Orange is the New Black. Yes. Was that an hour? It was an hour. It yeah. was an hour. More or less. But you did – right. So you had really, in a sense, creative freedom uh, because you weren't confined by the boundaries of the structure yeah, that of was a pretty... commercial advertising. How did you find working for those companies in terms of – was it like the old studio or the old network situation as far as the suits getting involved in the stories? Yeah, I mean, the first year of, of Jessica, uh, the suits were very, very much involved. But mm. then we won a Peabody, and that was hands off. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. Did you have, pre- you know, we all know about how they have these remarkable algorithmic research. They know everything everyone's doing at every moment. Did they come back to you and say, ah, gee, you know, about 15 minutes in, everybody went and got a cup of coffee? It hadn't quite kicked in uh, at that time of Jessica, but since then, as I've been creating other other works it has become a, a bigger – there's more of a, the goal being, well, we're going after this audience or that audience. Yeah. But the, actually the most frightening thing was uh, in, in casting, uh, when we're like taking projects to actors to attach them, they now uh, – I handed me the casting sheet of each actress. Uh, this role happened to be for an actress. Uh, the, the representatives, some of their credits, and then how many followers they have. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. And yeah, well, so they used to have TVQ in the old days. Oh, yeah, that's Which, right. You know, the Q. The your Q, Q, right. I'd never seen it before and, until recently, and now wow. it's like, well, this actress, she may be better, but but look at this one. She's got a million followers. I was like, well, this is oh, such wow, the wrong just, way to cast. Wow. Oh, but, wow, you know, it's funny. When you talk about creative freedom, I, there is no such thing as absolute creative freedom. It's a myth, you know, because right. you're always beholden to someone. You're always, even at Melissa's level, she's a showrunner. She starts to take notes from the studio, from the producing pod, whoever it is from the network. Sure. For me doing episodic, I'm I'm not there to do a Level Spyro film. I'm there to make a Melissa Rosenberg story, you know, if I'm doing Dexter or something like that, which right. I never got to do because we wanted to stay married to each other. <laughs> but, um, There's the secret, folks. <laughs> so, but when I'm doing pilots and features, I've done quite a few of each of those, and then I'm really a filmmaker and I'm helping create that universe. But as an episodic director, you're trying to bring what you can to the table, but it's your job. To, I'm, I'm making a Mitch Hurwitz film for Arrested Development. Yeah, well, we, 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 I, w- I was cast uh, in, in some in some projects, and Liev directed me. What was the first thing that we that we did together? It was Arrested Development. Arrested yeah. Development. Yeah. And and the, the, remember you were the, part of the Church and State Fair. Yeah, I, remember, I know, yeah. such a funny premise. Yeah. And and we, I had a camel to work with. Yes, there, there was, was a, a, because a there was a young lady. Joke. Yes, yes, she yes. was doing a. Uh, she was singing "We Three Kings" with a camel toe. Yes. Uh, which involved pulling the camel. Pulling camels. the camel. <laughs> which, camels are the cam- miserable uh, creatures. Oh, it, the, 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 I can't say. Couldn't get the camel up the ramp. I could not get it into the tent. 
And I spent 45 <laughs> minutes with the animal trainer saying, no, just be patient. And my day is slipping away. Yeah, now. right. 12 you hours can... to do 12 pages. We're waiting and for I the finally, camel. All right. I called Hurwitz and said, I'm dying here. Can I make a joke out of the fact that I can't get the camel in the tent? Say, yeah, do what you need to do. Good. So then I had David Cross just record a thing where he's urging them to pull the camel on stage. I couldn't use any of that because it ended up being a stream of masturbation jokes. Oh, gosh. Just pull on it till it comes. I won't go. I won't <laughs> oh, really? Just, I, and I was oh, just dear. dying of laughter, but I couldn't use any of it. And, yeah. of course, the terrible thing was that right after that I did that show, the writer decided to stop writing it. Remember? They, that was the last show in, in the series. He said, I don't want to do it anymore. You don't oh, remember that? Uh, for, I've, for I've closed a lot of shows. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah. The oh, I told them when I, when I uh, cast you in that, I said, Phil's a closer. <laughs> yeah. And the other funny thing about that was I didn't have a script, and I thought it was going to be all improvised. Yeah. And then I walked in and, and uh, Mem memorized these. Uh, I, me I had to memorize everything in like five minutes. Yeah. You know? Well, two page monologue. Come on. Yeah. yeah. So now you yeah. did something for Netflix as well for um, the Waltons Homecoming. Wasn't that a Netflix deal? Was that on Netflix? No. It doesn't was, sound right. It was, uh, that was on Oh, I'm sorry. The C -double. God, I've got to fire this writer. I, yeah. I, I, I put this I in I think the that's wrong. your handwriting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I meant you did Insatiable and Orange is the New Black. I did, yes. The Waltons was probably... The CW. The CW. That was the highest rated thing on the CW that year. I got a lovely award from the... Christopher Awards, which was like oh, this the biggest thing. Christian family yeah. film association. <laughs> Christopher? Which is called the Christopher yeah. Award. Mm. And I was afraid they were going to send me like a giant gold crucifix. Yeah. You know, my dad broke a chain of 16 generations of rabbis by becoming a psychiatrist. So I was like, <laughs> I hope it's not a giant crucifix. They sent me a very tasteful statue of St. Christopher carrying baby Jesus across the river. Oh, very nice. So it, it's, it's, it's on my shelf. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That shelf must be groaning, groaning with with, with trophies by now. Yes. Yeah, so you have multiple Peabodies between you. I mean, you also got a Peabody for an, uh, Dexter for Dexter. Now, why did Dexter, um, a serial killer, how did he get a Peabody? Yeah, honey, defend that uh, easily. <laughs> Dexter, at his core, is about a, a man searching for his humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's very highbrow. Wow. <laughs> wow. But he's yeah. trying to figure out what it is to be human. He's mm -hmm. like an alien dropped down. And, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, that's the, the gist you, of it. You did another alien-oriented uh, series early on, didn't you? Was it oh, Ro Dark Ros Skies. Oh, yes, yes. Dark Skies, yeah. That, that was, was a good one. You've, you've gone deep into the, uh, yeah. the files. Well, so. I, watched, the I watched some of these things. And, oh, my yeah. gosh, I know her. You know? <laughs> That's the fun of it often, you know. And you're into vampirism. Uh, I, with, with the I am. Saga. I'm into writing about them in any the, the event. Yeah, the Twilight Saga. That was a. That was a. Is that what's your? Well, you seem to be vampirism. do everything. But what's your favorite genre? Uh, I think Jessica Jones really uh, sums up everything that uh -huh. I love most. Uh, it's genre stuff. It's um, heightened, re grounded in, in reality. So as opposed to like going and writing Game of Thrones, for instance, which is a, you're creating worlds. Yeah. This is taking genre and, into our own world. And as Twilight is the same thing. And, um, you know, black humor and uh, and character driven. Those, those are my mm – -hmm. that's mm -hmm. where I live and breathe. Mm -hmm. if, if I could offer some more marital advice because we sure. seem to be interested yeah, oh, please. in this. Yeah. Yeah. And when men come to me and say, you know, they're having trouble making ends meet, I say, look, just do what I did. You marry a woman that writes an incredibly successful franchise of films and then you're okay. Yeah, that's a good, good that's advice. A good, good advice. People that, don't listen. That pretty often. easy to follow too. Other yeah. people are are asking about Marshall Marshall Blitz. What did what did Blitz? You know how do you, how do you survive the fights? Yeah, but you guys only probably only have creative fights. Like no, he wouldn't we, do that. We don't actually <laughs> fight about stuff. No, no, no I imagine we've, we've made it a rule of the marriage not to work together. Who so. does the dishes? We take turns, but mostly. Lately, me, because Lev does all the cooking. Yes. Yeah. Well, you true. have – I have that same arrangement with my wife. You, mm -hmm. He who cooks does not clean. Yeah. Mm. Well, That's he who reason. cooks sometimes cleans <laughs> in my house, but the other person uh, takes care of the dogs at night. I have to take care of the dog too. Ah. Yeah. Well, you, you know the, the old Amish expression, kissing don't last, cooking do. No, I never heard that one. No, you didn't know. That's oh. a very famous uh, Amish expression about marriage. Hmm. Kissing don't last, cooking do. Uh, okay. You're I, listening I just to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. Write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ted Bonnet. He's Phil Proctor. I and am. our guests today are Melissa Rosenberg and Liv Spiro. A wonderful, can we call you a Hollywood power couple? 
Uh, you can call yeah. us anything you want. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hollywood, but yeah. I mean, you don't come off as power couple. You come no. off as real people. Sh- real people. Uh, how do you do that? Yeah. Anyway. How, do you, how do you do that and succeed in this town? <laughs> Sometimes you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, back to the business. Now we've had a pandemic and we've had a strike that was devastating. The LA has, writers strike. Yeah, the writer strike. strike. Now the it's uh, the uh, Aitsi strike. Aitsi. Aitsi. You say Aitsi. If you can say it. Let's call the whole thing off, please. Let's get back to work. It just from people I know in the business trying to sell scripts right now to get tv or movies made very hard it's very very difficult a friend of mine who has a bunch of novels who's been working for years to get and great stuff by the way with netflix but you know it's been rocky because peak it's post peak tv netflix is i doubt you could call them in an existential crisis but life got real for them finally and now we're finding you know there's a lot of, it's really going overseas you're finding money all around the world Projects to fund these Italy, things Bulgaria. I mean, how how scattered is it from your perspective as people who rely on that system well, yeah, you there definitely, it? you definitely feel it. Um, mm-hmm. There was definitely a lag after has been still going on since the strike. You know, we all sort of thought, oh, we're going to jump back into work, and it's really taking the studios, the buyers, uh, you know, a long time to figure out what they are now, how they're going to make money, you know, what wh- what their their model is. That's right. It's all it's all in a in a cocktail, right? Well, now, there really. is no model, right? I mean, well, there's yeah, the model kind of gone to hell. It's uh, the they, they call it the Wild West now. Yeah. You know, because everybody's trying to find their footing. But I, I feel like I'm just – I was t- telling Lev as we were driving over here. I was like, I'm getting the feeling that it's sort of uh, picking up a little bit. For, for And, of course, the writers will have to come first so we can create the material that right. the actors and crews can, can yeah, shoot. Yeah, I, I have lots of friends on the crew side of things, and they're still hurting pretty oh, bad. Yeah. So, but but bad. Melissa was saying, well, it's starting to pick up for writers, so hopefully that will trickle down. Move yeah, but the, I remember when the strike 20 years ago – because we were promoting, I had a business doing radio campaigns for feature film releases for all the major studios, and with, I remember with there, Peter Bergman, yeah, with Peter Bergman, and, and we knew that the inevitable slowdown was going to come post strike settlement, yeah. but we had to get going. But it came back. Yeah. It took maybe a year, maybe even a little more than a year, a year, a year and a half before things got back up to speed. But that's when people went to movies, and we had a system. And the online environment had not completely fragmented things. And now you have, not only because of the internet, you have a decentralization of the industry, too. Um, I understand that one of the biggest facilities ever is being constructed in Austin now, a studio Mm. facility in Mm. Austin, Texas. And uh, we all know how things have moved from New Orleans now to Atlanta. I I can give you an example. I saw, uh, I go to the Writers Guild screenings, Mm -hmm. and uh, I saw The Young Woman in the Sea, which you will love, Melissa, Mm -hmm. because it's a true story of the first woman back in the 19, uh, early early 19, uh, 20th century, who swam the English Channel. Mm -hmm. And it's an it's an amazing, empowering story. Well, the director, uh, not the director, excuse me, the writer, uh, who also is a producer, they had to shoot it in Bulgaria. Okay, so Bulgaria played England and France, and the Black Sea played the part of the English Channel. Mm. Okay, but it worked magnificently. And Italy, Italy yeah. has a thirty to forty percent rebate right now, mm-hmm. so things are going to go over there, and there's overseas money. Which which helps. Now, you wrote, Melissa, you wrote um, all five screenplays to the Twilight Saga. And that was a – that grossed more than $3 billion. Congratulations, world. Yeah, wow. Thank that's, you. That's, that's fantastic. That's when you um, bought your dogs, right? Yeah. So you're just getting – oh, man, what, a, what must have been just – I'm sure there was pressure on you. But at the same time, pretty sweet, mm-hmm. like like what? three in. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I first uh, was approached about doing the the book, adapting the first novel, uh, I, I really had no idea what what it was like and mm. what it meant to so many people. And mm-hmm. I, th- I started to work on it and, and just popped into the internet to sort of see, all right, what is this fan base like? And I ran screaming. I was like, I don't, I'm not, you know, plugged my ears and, mm-hmm. nah, 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 you know, just like, nah. <laughs> I don't want to know because, I, you know, knowing... That too much pressure. Too much. But then, of course, after the first movie came in, and it, you know, I, I then well, I was in Hall H when it it aired, and all the like five thousand screaming 
fan. That's, that's a Comic Con reference. Uh, yes. for, oh, is that oh, what that is? Yeah. yeah. Right. Wow, that was very inside. Very inside. Yep. Hall H. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here to translate. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then I really uh, was sort of, you know, panicked because I was like, oh my God, I changed the book. I, I altered stuff. They're going to ah. tar and feather me here. And, and uh, <laughs> fortunately, they didn't. But uh, yeah, but then I knew about the, the fan base for the next four. And yeah, it's a lot, you know. That's enlightening. Now, do, do you see those kind of opportunities given the landscape of the industry now? Do you see the potential for people to have that kind of a run like that? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I'm. Or is it? I'm f- always chasing it. I because I, you know, I'm a, a TV writer by at, at heart. Yeah. You know, I love a continuing storyline. So yes. for me, if you're putting all the effort into a two-hour movie. Like to then have it just end. Like just, hopefully you're invested enough in these characters that you can just keep going with them. So for me, it's about just great storytelling and and you know. And it goes back to peak TV, where it's almost the equivalency to do that on a streamer now mm-hmm. to have like a hit show like Stranger Things or something like that. Well, it goes back to your marriage too, because you're having a continuing series. <laughs> <laughs> you like the long run, but <laughs> we we do. I was afraid you were going to say something about vampires or the undead. No. That well, would have been actually, bad. I want to ask you, Lev, you're doing something on the radio yourself now, aren't you? I am. I'm doing a, a show that is about uh, music for television and film. It's called The Soundtrack. It's a lot of fun, folks. I it's listen on, to it. Uh, yeah, it's on uh, the last Wednesdays of each month on uh, on another station. I won't say the I won't say the name. I don't want to be you know disloyal. It's, it's a it's a commercial station, right? No, it's not. Oh, it's also okay. well, then, support. I think you can say that, couldn't you? Okay, it's called the SoCal Sound. It's eighty-eight point five. Sure, yes. why not? <laughs> Maybe some of the same listeners support both stations. Who knows? Lev, you got an. I, I'm not shilling for Peabody. No, <laughs> I got a Peabody too. So I, I did get was, a Peabody, although yeah, you, I don't. You know, I I got it for directing several episodes of a show called Unreal. Oh, and. Uh, it's funny because I know the, the gentleman who was running the Peabody Awards at the time was the chairman of my department in Austin, where I went to graduate school, uh-huh. Morris Newcomb. No kidding. Oh, wow. And I happened to sit down uh, to dinner with him a couple of years later, and I told him about my Peabody, and he kind of rolled his eyes and said, yeah, there was a lot of discussion about whether directors should get Peabodys for episodic shows or not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, so clearly there was some dissension, but I got one. Darn it. <laughs> that's, all right. Right. that's all that matters. So yes. I started with Roger Corman, oh, who was considered yeah. the king of B-movies. Yeah. Yes, he was. Day, yeah. Who just recently passed. passed. But, uh, I came out here looking for work well from respected. New York in, in the mid-70s and got a, a meeting with Roger ah. in Brentwood, I guess it was. He uh-huh. had his office. And it, he was the most, he, you know, I was just a kid. He's an erudite, soft-spoken, oh intelligent goodness. guy. I was shocked. I was expecting Sammy yeah. Glick, you know, yeah. Yeah. cigar chomping. He was lovely. Even to a 19-year-old, he, he was in a white suit in a white office. It yeah. was so modern. Yeah. And he gave me a half an hour and at the end said, cool, you want to come out? I'll give you an editing job. Nice. Yeah. I did my first movie for Roger and he did, you know, I had the, you go and sit in his office. He talks to all new directors and yeah. explains how you need to have either sex or violence every 10 minutes in the film. Uh, <laughs> and I, but I will tell you that the first film that I directed was a comedy and he liked it so much that he asked me to take the nudity out of the film. Oh, for He told me, I'm going to brag on the radio, he said I was the first director he had asked to do that since Jonathan Demme. Oh, my wow. gosh. It was my badge of honor. From the what was the days. movie called? It was called Welcome to Planet Earth. It stars oh, yeah. uh, George Wendt uh, and yes, Shanna I, Reed. I, I love that movie. It's a yeah. wonderful film, especially if you have a beer or two. Did that start? Did that? Did 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 it work for you like it worked for so many? Did it start? I mean, your absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Where, I mean, for, what happened? You just were able to knock on doors after that? Uh, no. Well, what happened was I had done this film and I was with an agency at the time. They had yet to get me any work, and I was riding up the elevator with a box of half-inch dubs. Remember those things called VHS sure. tapes, right? Yeah. And there was a woman in the elevator who said, "Oh, welcome to Planet Earth. Did you work on that?" I said, well, I, "I directed it." And she said, "You're Lev. Said, You're a comedy genius. Would oh, you would you like to do television?" And I said, "Why, yes, I would." <laughs> and that's how I started. Wow. Well, they say the business has its ups and downs. Yeah, so, and right. in an elevator. <laughs> okay. Let's right. get into Beverly Hills Chihuahua Three. I think we should. <laughs> yeah. What was that? Now you get a job saying, it "Hey, is. Lev, can you do Beverly Hills Chihuahua Three? And Not I- two. Well, they did. They said, uh, yeah, okay. The truth is, they, they sent me this script, and I was not very enamored of it. And my agents ganged up on me and said, you should do this. And I said, have you read the script? Why? And <laughs> they said, it, because it? it's for big Disney, you know, it's, it's, for, it's a DVD release, but you're working with all the feature side people. 
not just the, you know, I had done Disney Channel films. So uh, I did it, and I'm very proud of it, actually. I think it's the best Chihuahua there is. Ah, well, uh, it is certainly the yeah. finest of the Chihuahua films. Was the script, my, was the script dog-eared, by the way? Uh, it was heavily yeah. dog-eared, yes. Thank you. Thank That's you. A, lot of, a lot of ads. Um, uh, That's wonderful. Were there a lot of treats on set? There were a lot of treats. Were the you know, dog- Phil, when, when Phil asked me to do the show, he called me up. He's like, Lev, and he sounded like Sammy Glick. He's like, I can hear the cigar. He's like, Lev, kid, you got a face made for radio. You got to come do this show. And I'm like, I have to think about that. But yeah, but here I am. Well, oh, when, you, so when you say hit DVD film, yes. that was when DVDs were big. Oh, man. Big, Actually, big. it was. We all lived was, off of that. It, DV, when I was shooting the film, DVDs were like entering sharp decline. Mm-hmm. And th- when that film came out, it was the highest grossing DVD of the year, but it was a huge disappointment because the drop, the bottom had already dropped out. Oh, Netflix wow. was already taken off and people were streaming. Now, were the dogs naked in that film? Or yes. did you, yeah, they were. No, I insisted. You, you covered them up? Good. Yeah. No, I insisted. They oh, you insisted they'd be naked. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to, it'd be very natural. I don't okay. want any I artists. Did, I wanted, did the dog have its own room and a break? You know, the lead dogs had attitudes. Your your joke. First of all, I have to tell oh, you, yeah, uh, I was shocked the, the first time I had the dog on set. We're rehearsing. Yeah. Uh, the and the, it was very well. It was the lead dog, Pe- Pepe, I think it was the or Poppy who was the name, and uh, we had put these little tape marks on the floor. And this dog walks through a door, looks down, stops on its mark. <laughs> oh, I was like, wow. I half the actors I worked with can't do that. You know. Of course, he didn't say his lines that well, but. But you know, he played I, a hell of a piano. There was a, my favorite scene is what is a piano recital. Her favorite by, scene I've ever directed uh, the, was from the movie. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, and fun. Freaking Try funny. getting a camel to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I was in the middle of the Saudi Arabian yeah. desert. Yeah. And I was a camel. Yeah. And I went up to the camel and I fed it and I fed it and I fed it. And then it just looked at me and spit all over me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's how they say thank you. Yeah. I'm going to share <laughs> some of this fine food with you. Yeah. Like a baby bird. Mm-hmm. Right? Try getting back on the bus. Yeah, I worked. <laughs> I did a, a show uh, about Francis Scott Key, and I played uh, his best friend, John Randolph of Virginia, who was a senator. Very eccentric man. He appeared uh, in the Senate with two Afghan hounds and uh, a little black boy dressed in beautiful <clears throat> silks, hmm. you know, because he had inherited slaves. And he freed them all uh, at the point of his birth. He was definitely uh, against slavery. But portraying this character uh, down in the Baltimore studios uh, of of public television, they wanted the dogs to be affectionate to me. So they put meat all (laughs) over me. Right, I had, I had meat in my shoulders and meat in my pants, and it was the first time I ever had. Well, meat actually, in we my tried it with a couple of guests, but it didn't go no, well. No. <laughs> yeah, I guess was a vegan. Who knew? Yeah, the dogs ignored me completely. I feel bad. That whole story we told you about meeting at a Halloween party, me dressed as Elron Hubbard. It was I had meat all all over my my clothes, and that's you, really you did. yeah. Well, you know, oddly enough, I uh, have performed in a lot of Elron Hubbard's short stories. Yeah, which is. So much fun. He was a very prolific and entertaining writer in all genres. I suddenly feel the urge to pay you $1,000 to become more enlightened. <laughs> Give it to the state. Hey, listen, for all you feel about it, at least those tax dodge dollars go to, went to some creativity. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I can go there. <laughs> no, okay. I'm, go there. <laughs> I'm just trying to... Just trying to, trying to like half subject, full yeah. glass, you know. <laughs> but now you've retired from directing. Well, yes and no. Uh, okay. uh, I stopped doing episodes, which was the bulk of my work. Gotcha. Uh, I'm still reading scripts for features and okay. pilots. And oh, when good. I say reading scripts, I mean I'm not actually directing them, but I'm, I'm, I'm considering directing. Good. Oh, yes. Good. Good. So if any of uh, the wonderful people listening to the show have something you'd like directed or made, uh, yeah, send me a brilliant, well-realized script. Have, Give, you, have you had to do any pitching uh, recently? Because I understand that a lot of pitches are done on Zoom now. Now, which yeah, well, it really defeats the whole purpose of the chemistry of things, don't yeah, you how, think? How do you adapt to that? It's uh, I've been doing a lot of that actually since the pandemic, and still even now, okay. uh, everything everything has been doing on uh, happening on Zoom. I mean, the 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 positive thing is that you can have the the um, what do you, uh, 
the strip on the top yeah, of yeah. people's you, faces. Um, what do you call them when you yeah. you have this sort of teleprompter app that goes and, and rolls through uh, your script. Oh, I see. Uh, and if you can ah. manage to make it sound like you're actually uh, conversational, that's great. But you also can have uh, a slideshow going on, which, you know, in, in live and in person, I usually bring like a book yeah, of right, boards right. of photographs. It's but this is better. Than better. A deck. Oh, okay. A deck. Yeah, a deck. Right. So putting it together is a big pain in the ass, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've gotten nope. used to it. You adapt to it, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been doing uh, networking events and stuff just in the work I'm doing, and it's all online now. Mm-hmm. And it's just – it's an adjustment. It's cool because people from all over the world are on the call, mm. but that inorganic contact and delay just makes it just less yeah. than less than warm and cozy. Yeah, but I, I do is, miss the in-person, but, uh, you know, it has its benefits. You're both very established, but for people who are getting into it, this new world where it's all going, we've been talking about yeah. about YouTube and how YouTube suddenly is taking 10% of all TV viewership. And the the young people who grew up on YouTube, they're native to it. There's something I found out about called the YouTube New Wave movement, which the younger people – are evolving out of the frenetic, fast, crash-cutting banality into what they consider less cuts, longer, traditional storytelling. Right. So they're embracing that, and it's all coming up that way. I mean— That's good news. Yeah, and I I suppose, obviously, at both of your stations, this is not something you really have to concern yourself. You're deeply rooted in the traditional business. Uh, That's not uh, not something that appeals to me, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think all of these things— at core, as I said before, story is story, story. A story and, is a story, uh, is a story. Everyone, people are always going to want to be told stories. Yeah, that's so That's true. never going to go away. Right. And, and it so really whatever was, it form really, it takes is, yeah. is Well, this so-called cool. democratization of media. The, the entire industry is, is just completely changing. The, the technology, yeah. the, the media is the message. Thank you, Marshall McLuhan. But you still want so to true. tune in to see a well-crafted Highly produced I'm, program. I'm, you, well, you, you were saying we're both part of the establishment, which sounds vaguely uh, <laughs> not, 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 yeah, <laughs> not worthy. But uh, I, I mentor students about three or four a year, and I tell them the same thing when it, the subject of new technologies comes up and marketing platforms yeah. and this, that, and the other, is that the craft of directing really hasn't changed in the last 120 years. And, and converting mm-hmm. words on the page into moving pictures and doing that in a compelling fashion is the same craft it has been. So, you know, I, during my career, we went from uh, shooting on film to shooting digital. It didn't really affect my work that much. Yeah, it was the same uh, with the Fireside mm-hmm, Theater, mm-hmm. making that transition. Yeah. You know, uh, did you guys both start w- with a, a knowledge that you wanted to do what you ended up doing? Were you, did you tell stories as a kid and did you direct, see things visually? Uh, I got the bug in college. I was a political science student okay, uh, and communication arts, so I was doubly horrified when the last president, uh, that guy, got elected. <laughs> yeah, um, I've heard of him. And I have tried to, what I consider pro-social content, I try to put in uh, progressive messages into my work where I can, which is tough on Disney Channel. And really, it's it's much more sophomoric than that. I try to insult the other side when I can. Oh, very uh, And I consider that to be pro-social content. But um, <laughs> uh, I forgot the question. Well, you answered it. So that's the important thing. Oh, yeah. Had, had I didn't, in, I yeah. You said in bug. college you got the In the college bug. because I, I took my first film course uh, when I was 23, perhaps 22, and I realized, oh, this combines all these things I love to do. It combines yeah. drama, psychology, photography, music. Oh, wow. And, gee, could I be a director? And I yeah. went off to Austin to film school and, and uh, got training. A great creative town. How, how about you, Melissa? How did you get the bug? Well, as a kid, I definitely would uh, was into uh, storytelling telling and uh but also dance uh-huh. and uh so when i went to college i actually my undergraduate is in dance and theater i had this uh, fantasy of becoming a choreographer but oh. quickly realized that i wasn't probably good enough to merit starving in new york for any period of time so i came out to la and uh that's where i discovered that uh film and television was written how'd that, you, how'd that, you that get that was an actual oh, yeah, job, it was written, you know? right. i mean now the, of course it's it's well known it, you know people yes, in Poughkeepsie understand uh what a showrunner does uh, i hope but how'd you get your first job 
Yeah, and showrunner is well, like a superhero job in Hollywood. Oh yeah, it's an awesome job. It's like it's, it's a, to, to explain what a, a showrunner is by definition. It's really the 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 creative force behind the show. The the the, the, the studios or the production companies look to the showrunner to deliver the goods. Well, we're we're the constant in in television because you're constant. It, you know, you're doing eight, ten, twelve, thirteen episodes. And uh, so there's got to be one person who's tracking all of that. You can't have uh, – I mean, I guess people – nowadays there'll be a, a single director who goes through them all and obviously the actors. But the the primary in a series is that one creative voice, is mm-hmm. that, that person who's really seeing every aspect of it. And it's such a – it's an incredibly uh, grueling job because you mm. are in – So much you know, detail, I'm sure. Every fra- – you know, costumes, production, editing, music. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and it's also an incredibly satisfying job because you're in every frame of it, <laughs> you know. So it's a really um, uh, fulfilling, fulfilling yeah. and exhausting job. But I also, uh, in terms of how did I, I think you mentioned how did I get in? Yeah, how did yeah. you get started? Well, I mean, so I, I went to an undergrad at, at Bennington and graduate school at uh, USC at the Peter Stark Program for Producing, ah, and they're both uh, very small programs. But there were four women who had done both. So when I graduated, oddly, so when I graduated, I reached out to one of the alumni, as you do as yeah, a graduate, you reach right. out to your fellow alumni, and uh, who was Liz Glosser at um, Castle Rock. And I reached out to her and said, you know, I'm a writer. I want to go in. She reads my script. She says, this is great. I, you know, we, can, we can't make it, but I'm going to help you get an agent. She gets sidetracked. So her, she ends up sending it to another friend of hers, and she's yeah. like, "This is great. I'm going to get you an agent. We're not going to make it, but <laughs> but she sends it to her fa- her various different agents. The agents then call, like, I said, great, okay. So she gives yeah. four yeah. agents. They start calling me and saying, "When can I get this script? When can I get it?" I'm thinking, "What did she wow. say to them? My wow. God, this is." And so one of them even wants to meet with me before. They read the script. They read I'm the like, script. Great, wow. let's do it. And I go into this meeting, and it's a very a small but but uh, uh, very uh, uh, well known agency. agency. And um, they're sitting there. The, the owner of the agency comes in. So he's pitching me on the agency, and they're going on and on. And one of them says, "Yeah, we even, we just made a great deal for your mother." And I'm like. What? You guys are good because she's been dead for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they think that oh. I am Joan Rivers' daughter. Joan Rivers' daughter. Her name is Melissa – or was at the time Melissa oh, Rivers. Right, I think she's right, Melissa right. Rivers right. now. Yeah. So I've, I uh, got in via nepotism and being related to absolutely Fantastic. no one. Wow. <laughs> wow. What a great story. <laughs> fake, fake so you became an nepotism. it girl without even – Without be- being it. Without, yeah. yeah, fantastic. And I always admire about showrunners and, and episodic directors too is how they keep uh, – watch these really beautifully crafted series on, on the streamers. And they're so – Unified, they're so similar. It's like you think the same director and writer did the whole yeah, series, like a super and it's supervisor. not. That's a real skill to come in there and conform. That's the keep that in your head. You know? She's the creative force behind all the decisions that go into that show, and it's the director's job as they come on to fit themselves into that right uh, that right. vision. That as a showrunner, that is your ta- one of your many tasks is to keep it. Keep cohesive. Cohesive. Yeah. yeah. And wow. have it, you know, it needs a voice. Every show has an individual voice, and, uh, you know, you have to make sure you're bringing it. Well, Wonderful. we're out of time. Wonderful. What fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Good luck to you both. 